All right, assalamu alaikum. So do you have any questions uh, from the previous lectures? Okay, so today we're going to discuss the Hodgkin, Huxley model for ionic transport. And we're going to build on the uh, discussion of an equivalent circuit that we introduced in the previous lecture. So let me redraw the equivalent circuit here. So <clears throat> we have two rails. One represents the inside of the cell and the other represents the outside of the cell. And we have a current source, I, in between the two rails. First of all, we have a, a resistor and a battery, V naught, resistor R, between the two rails. And we also have the membrane capacitance, C or CM, between the two rails. And we looked at this circuit model and we were able to find out what the voltage across the membrane is going to look like as a function of time, if we know what this current looks like as a function of time. Now, this represents an inbuilt, a constant, a static battery inside the circuit. And this has resonance with the idea of the nursed potential. So we have an inside of the neuron and an outside of the neuron, the membrane that separates the inside from the outside, which might have a myelin sheath on top of it, or it could be bare, will have a certain capacitance. And the inside has a certain potential with respect to the outside. And that leads to the, if there is some excitation, it leads to the action potential. Now, if you recall from the previous lecture, if we have a current I, that is zero and we switch it on at some time to some value I naught, we were able to find out what the membrane potential would look like. And we were able to really look at it from an analytical perspective, an accurate analytical perspective. To begin with, when there is no current, this point is clamped at V naught whatever V naught is, could be positive, could be negative. And as the current switches on, this capacitor begins to charge. This current might flow in, into this branch and we were able to write a differential equation and solve that differential equation. And we noted that the voltage goes up and it goes up by an amount I naught R, it goes towards I naught R. Actually, it goes towards V naught plus I naught R, correct? And if the current drops in the meantime, this would then go back to V naught, okay? So this was our equivalent circuit model for a simple model of a neuron, which is sometimes called an integrate and fire model. It's called an integrate model because this capacitance really integrates the current. So if I have Q and I put CV and I look at the voltage, voltage is one over C into Q and Q is the integral of I, isn't it? So that's why this circuit is called an integrator. Now, remember that if this current is left on in the on position for a long period of time, then this voltage is going to asymptote towards V naught plus I naught R. Let's call this voltage V infinity, okay? Just I'm introducing a nomenclature here. I call this V infinity because if time is left to run till infinity, or till very long times, longer than the time constant, then this voltage is going to approach 
v infinity so there's an exponential rise or a relaxation towards v infinity and when the current is switched off then this becomes the new v infinity the new v infinity becomes v not so in between the two parts of the cycle the voltage the membrane voltage is switching towards the equilibrium voltages which are denoted as v infinity so this is the general behavior of the integrate and fire model of a neuron now we would like to build upon these ideas and remember we derived the solutions analytically in the previous lecture so this is something i might ask in the exam right and today i'm going to also build the basis for the second homework which is going to be a computational homework now we would like to see how hodgkin and huxley extended this idea and looked at came up with an equivalent circuit for the transmembrane ionic transport and really they at that time in the 1930s they wouldn't know what the biophysical basis of the action potential would look like so they explored this idea purely from an experimental perspective and then fit the data to the model which is that of an equivalent circuit right only after hodgkin and huxley did the biophysical and the biochemical basis for ionic transport come to the fore so with the help of experiments modeling and simulation an accurate a very accurate mathematical model could be built and that's the purpose of why i have decided to include this particular description in this course so i just for the neuron this idea has to be extended a little bit because we know that there are sodium channels and there are potassium channels and there are other kinds of channels as well in the membrane so one idea would be to so could you uh, predict what the uh, what a more realistic model of neuron would look like how would it be different from this model what would we need to do so remember if there is no current flowing and everything is in equilibrium equilibrium means no current flows if everything is in equilibrium the voltage here is reflective of this voltage v not okay so could you propose how could i incorporate the effect of sodium channels potassium channels and other leak channels yes right 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 because you know that these ionic channels they are voltage gated we've already discussed that there's a particular voltage that opens up a channel or closes a channel so somehow we need to make these resistors voltage dependent okay and we have different channels for potassium and sodium so we would like to add respective branches for sodium potassium and for other ions so the model that is presented is the following so we have so what about this how does this look like so this is again my inside of the cell this is my outside of the cell so my outside is assumed to be at 0 volt so if i talk about a membrane potential which is this potential v i'm really talking about the intracellular potential so inside with respect to the outside i have one branch for potassium i have one branch for sodium and i have one branch for others which i call leak okay now the good thing is that i can make this variable i can make this variable because as you know at a certain point if you look at our discussion from the action potential description the sodium ion is activate the sodium ion channel is activated then it is 
inactivated and the potassium ion channel is activated so the sodium ion which is activated let sodium ions in and then it switch switches off the sodium ions when the gate is inactivated and then the potassium ion gate opens up in response to a certain voltage which allows outgress of the potassium ions which restores the polarization of the neuron right so this is something you'll have to revise on your own it's always good to to if you want i can give you 2 minutes to browse through your notes and see whether you'd like to look at the description for action potential again <clears throat> so the sodium conductance goes up and then falls rapidly and the potassium conductance rises slowly gradually gently okay all right so now let's focus our attention on this uh, circuit so we have a resistance for potassium we have a resistance for sodium and we have a resistance for others a leak resistance this leak resistance is assumed to be constant it's not voltage gated it is always active okay but these conductances uh, these resistances change okay they can change in response to a voltage so these resistances are voltage dependent all right and here we have a battery let's call this v sub k which is the nurse potential for potassium about minus 75 millivolts this is the nurse potential for sodium which is about plus 55 millivolts this is the nurse potential for the other ions vl which is about minus 50 millivolts okay we've already derived these nurse potentials in a particular class now when i say now uh, if you look at hodgkin hodgkin and hagley's original papers they've used a different notation or a different sign uh, convention for these batteries they use the same signs but they have flipped the sodium and and the this potential but i'm trying to be consistent here like a physicist so i put all these batteries in the same orientation and if something is positive it means if this vna is positive then it means that uh this is indeed the orientation of the battery and if vk is negative it means that i have to reverse this so the bottom Uh, so when i reverse this the up end i get negative here and positive here so this short stroke represents the negative side of a battery so if i vk is negative so i really have to invert this physically okay and that should be the case because you already know that what the potassium ions do is that they keep the inside negative the inside of the cell is kept negative so the negative side of this battery should really be upwards so either i could draw the battery in the proper orientation and make this positive or i could keep all the batteries in the same orientation and adjust the signs here in their numerical values that's what i've done over here now another thing that we need to know is that these resistances are voltage dependent now let's look at this circuit from a conceptual perspective using the ideas that we've already been exposed to over here one thing i would like to 
uh, you to recognize is that if I were to take the inverse of a resistance, I would get what is called a conductance. Okay. So the reverse of the sodium resistance is a conductance for the sodium. Generally has units of Siemens. Okay. Now what I would like to do, I would like to, I would like to talk about conductances rather than resistances because it's easier to understand the problem in terms of conductances. And then we also conform to what generally exists in the literature as well, G. So RL represents other ions, like chlorine ions, calcium ions, right. <clears throat> So you, what they had was, was the following. If you look at their original paper, RK, R sodium. This is what they had. This is potassium, sodium, others or leak and the capacitance. This is what they had. It doesn't make it this into series. It just changes the polarity of these batteries. Okay. But the problem with their notation is I, I cannot belittle them. Of course, uh, the problem with their notation is that they draw this circuit and then they put these potentials with these signs, which is very confusing for any student. All right. So I'm trying to be slightly proper here. So these are the resistances and their inverses are the conductances. Now suppose the conductance, let's focus our attention, focus on the potassium channel. Okay, so the potassium channel is really some set of pores which allows potassium ions to go through the membrane. Okay, we've already seen a physical model of this. Anyway, focus on the potassium channel. If the conductance of the potassium channel is, is zero, which means the resistance is really high, then it means that it's as if we have an open circuit here. This battery really has no role whatsoever. Okay, if on the other hand, we switch on the conductance, switch on the conductance. And I can make a graph for this. So this is my time. This is my GK. Initially, my GK is really low. So the resistance is very high. Nothing can, right? It's almost infinity, very high. And then I switch on the conductance, which, and I make GK really, really high. Okay, if I were to do that somehow, what's gonna happen is immediately current is going to flow through this branch, right? Because this resistance is now small. The conductance has been switched on by virtue of some voltage or whatever. So when that conductance is switched on, and if this resistance were then really small, the conductance is high, then this term I naught, the drop across this is really gonna be very small because this resistance is so small. So this will act like a somewhat like a short circuit. Isn't it so? When this resistance is small, it's just like a piece of wire, conducting wire, no resistance. If the conductance really switches on high, then when that happens, this potential, whatever the potential here is gonna appear here. And the inside of the membrane will be held at this potential which is the potential of the potassium battery, which is minus 75 millivolts. So by changing the conductance, switching on the conductance, it's possible to clamp this voltage, the membrane voltage at this battery. If both conductances are on, then it's going to be somewhere in a 
in, in a voltage in between these two voltages. But if one branch is on at one time, the conductance is high for one branch and the conductance is really low for the other branches, then this point, the inside of the membrane will be held at the potential of these ions, either potassium, sodium, or the other uh, leak leakage ions. Okay, yes. So turning on the conductance means, uh, so the conductance is, so the idea about a membrane in a neuron is that in a state of equilibrium, there is a certain concentration of potassium and sodium ions on both sides of the mem membrane. But when a nerve impulse takes place, an action potential is generated, which allows the permeability of ions across the membrane, okay? Which means suddenly the membrane has become porous to certain ions. So current is flowing, which means that the resistance has changed or the conductance has changed. So allowing a certain current to pass through the membrane, which really means that the conductance has changed. And that is triggered by voltages. Okay, so these are voltage dependent gates, voltage dependent channels, voltage gated channels as we uh, introduce this nomenclature, voltage gated channels. All right, so if, for example, I were to draw a picture, G sodium, this is my time, time, G potassium, G leakage is fixed, right? Time, and here let me plot V. Let me attempt to plot V, the action potential, right? Or the membrane potential. Suppose my G and A, everything is off. G and A suddenly switches on and then switches off. And when this switches off, let's suppose that at that time, G, K switches on, then switches off. All right. Now, can you estimate what this potential is going to look like? So far, we don't know how these conductances switch on and off, but we'll figure that out. But if this were true, what would this potential, the membrane potential look like? So when there's nothing happening, what's the membrane potential? Zero? VL, some VL, right? RL is small. It's going to be VL. When every, even if RL isn't small, in a steady state, no currents are flowing. No currents are flowing really means that this potential has to be the same as this potential if no current were flowing anywhere. So in a resting state, the potential is so somehow. I have to redraw this thing. What does I start with? I start off with VL. This is my VL. Then when the sodium conductance is switched on, I asymptote, my V infinity becomes V sodium. Right, so I approach V sodium. Suppose this is V sodium. And then when the sodium conductance goes low, the potassium conductance goes high. Then from here, I would like to exponentially relax towards V potassium. Okay, so go towards V potassium, which could be lower than VL. And then I go back to my VL. This is like an action potential in crude sense, right? This is an action potential. 
This is the state when you're below the VL. This is the state of hyperpolarization, by the way. Here, the neuron is polarized. The sodium channel is activated. The neuron gets depolarized, moves towards positive voltages. Remember that V sodium is positive, VK is negative. So we're starting off VK and VL both are negative. We're starting off with negative potentials, which is the resting potential or the potential of a polarized neuron. And when sodium gate opens, the action potential rushes towards the positive side, crossing zero, perhaps crossing zero. And then when the sodium gate is inactivated, the sodium influx and outflux stops. The potassium gate is activated. The con potassium conductance goes really high and the action potential relaxes towards exponentially towards the potassium battery. So an action potential is created by having these conductances voltage dependent or variable. So there has to be some knob, some switch that controls these conductances. That's what is happening naturally. That's what's happening inside the mammalian body. That's what's happening inside, uh, uh, inside a nerve or a neuron. Okay, now we can develop a mathematical model for this. So any questions up to this point? This is the conceptual understanding of the Hodgkin-Huxley model. Yes, please. So, Notice here, for these particular values, VL is minus 50, VK is minus, uh, uh, all right. So in this case, we will not have hyperpolarization. If this were lower than this, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. VK is lower than VL. So here, when the potassium conductance is on, you approach VK, which is minus 75. But then when the potassium conductance goes off, you approach VL, which is slightly higher. So you overshoot below the resting potential. That stage is called hyperpolarization generally. This is called the resting potential and this graph is called the action potential. So depolarization is called action potential. So this is a conceptual understanding of the Hodgkin-Huxley model. And the feat of Hodgkin and Huxley the University of Cambridge was to come up with a mathematical model that describes this. So they were doing experiments on a giant axon of a, taken from a squid and they were injecting current into it. They were really clamping the voltage. They were clamping the voltage and seeing how much current goes in. And they set the neuron at different voltages and found out what the current was on an oscilloscope. Then they repeated a large number of experiments, came up with a, a mathematical model and then fit the data to their mathematical model and did it empirically, did an empiric, empirical fit. The biochemistry and the biophysical process that led to that model was discovered later. It's really the power of experiments and the power of a mathematical model represented here by an equivalent electric circuit that gave birth to the field of neuroscience. All of neuroscience comes after this. All right, any questions before we move on to the mathematical aspects of this thing? Yes, please. So I'll put. <clears throat> All right. Now the <clears throat> we're going to develop a mathematical model which will allow you to write a computer program for this. Suppose for convenience, I start off with the potassium channel. Okay, and I talk about the conductance of the potassium channel, GK. 
and I want to make this voltage dependent. That's what I want, okay? But what is G? G is really, so if I would like to find out the current through the potassium channel, I will take the conductance of the potassium channel and multiply this by the voltage V, the membrane voltage minus VK, correct? This is Ohm's law. Isn't this Ohm's law? Yes, it is. So I sodium is G, K, G sodium V minus V Na. And I L is G L V minus V L. And by the way, the current through the capacitive branch is C dV by dt, right? So the current, the total current I naught or small i, if you look at the Kirchhoff's current law, the current is equally distributed. It's not equally, it's distributed among the four branches. So it has to be sum of all of these. Plus I L plus I C, right? So now this becomes a differential equation in the voltage, doesn't it? Right, because here you have dV by dt, here you have a V, you have a V, you have a V. Okay. So in the previous lecture, we just had two branches, one capacitive and one, which is just the leakage branch. Now we have added two more channels, one for sodium, one for potassium. So we want to make these conductances, all the Gs depend upon voltage, and perhaps also on time. That's the goal. Now, if you look at the conductance, so for the conductance, you really need, so if you look at the potassium channels conductance, you need the number of potassium pores, the number of potassium channels in the neuron, and you would need to know the conductance of each channel, right? And then you would also need to know whether the channel is open or whether it is closed. And there has to be a certain probability with that. So you need to multiply this with the probability. And that probability we propose depends upon the voltage and possibly the time as well, right? So we want to make this conductance depend upon voltage and time. So the number of channels is fixed. The conductance of each channel is fixed. That's a physical property. When it is fully open, what's the conductance? This will depend upon the structure, the chemistry of the channel, only some value. But then there has to be a probability that a potassium channel is open. All right. Now, uh, if you look at the potassium channel, we'd like to look at this probability. Now, if I were to make a diagram for how potassium channel conducts, so really it has, the potassium channel has four units or four subunits. And Hodgkin and Huxley didn't know this, but now we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We do know now that the potassium channel has four subunits, the protein has four subunits. And suppose this is a pore. And inside the cell, we have 75 millivolts. The cell is in the resting state and it's polarized. Potassium ions cannot go out. This pore is blocked, right? Now suppose some voltage is applied, which means that inside the cell, the potential goes up changing the voltage now. So it goes say up to minus 20 millivolts, minus 30 millivolts, zero millivolts. Now what's gonna happen is that this pore is gonna open up because the pore is voltage, the channel is voltage dependent, this pore opens up. Suppose just hypothetically, the pore opens up and these subunits, they change their conformation. And now potassium ions, can come out, they can ooze out from this, right? They can come out, right? From this pore. 
okay now each subunit has a probability suppose each subunit has a probability n of being open or closed okay so if the potassium channel were to open all four subunits have to simultaneously open so this means that this probability pk of course is a function of voltage because the pores are opening as a result of voltage possibly time as well is going to be equal to the fourth power of n because if this ion channel were to open all four subunits have to open and the probability that each one of them opening is n so that was the genius of hodgkin and huxley because they fit experimental data to the fourth power of something okay so now this n is generally called the voltage gating variable for the potassium ion now we have to see what how does this n depend upon voltage and time that's the next question so we have to ingrain embed voltage and time dependence into n any question so i'm going really slow here because this is like we have to build the logical argument any questions g this is the total number of pores in the neuron right <clears throat> so n must have some time dependence and it must have some voltage dependence all right the conductance is voltage dependent so we have shifted the onus on to this variable n right we just shifted the burden on finding the time dependence and the voltage dependence on this gating variable n right because the other things are constant now let's first of all look at the time dependence of n so once you know the time dependence of n and the voltage dependence of n you can solve these differential equations on a the computer these are easy to solve because these are first order and then you can simulate the action potential anyway that's our goal so let's look at the time dependence of n now <clears throat> suppose i have so there's a principle called the er ergodicity ergodicity which is used in stochastic systems and it's very important concept in in biophysics does anyone know what ergodicity means have you taken a course on stochastic systems or prob probability probability ke to liye na ergodicity means that if you have if you have one unit and you look at the probability of that unit whether it's open, say channel we talk about channel whether it's open or closed so what you could alternatively do is you could take a large number of identical channels and see the fraction which are open and the fraction that are closed and that fraction will be the same as the probability of a single channel being open so the fraction of open channels in a large ensemble in a large population is going to be the same as the probability of a single channel being open correct so you shift from the from one unit to a, a large ensemble this is the principle of ergodicity okay so if we invoke the principle of ergodicity uh, we could write that if n is the fraction of open channels in a population right so if you have channels that are open and closed and if n is the fraction of open channels then it's also going to be equal to the probability that a single channel is open 
So you have some voltage, some voltage, minus 20 millivolts, and you have 100 channels, and 30 of them are open. At the same voltage, if you pick a one particular channel, and you were to estimate the probability that this channel is going to be open, that's going to be 0.3. That's what ergodicity means. Got it? It's so ergodicity or stationarity is a very important concept in biophysics. So now suppose we would like to find out the time dependence. So what we would like to do is we would like to, like to model this as a reaction. So we have N channels that are open and we want to find out how many channels open per unit time. N channels that are open, dn by dt gives you how many channels open per unit time. So how do channels, so how do we find out this rate of opening of channels? So suppose I have a cluster of N channels that are closed. and some of them are open. So N channels closed. And here I have one minus N channels that are open and the rest are closed. So there has to be some process, some rate that closes channels and some rate that opens up channels, right? That's what we're trying to do trying to come up with a reaction. So dn by dt is, so let's go very slowly. dn by dt, the number of channels that open per unit time. Okay. How do we know that? The number of channels can open in two ways. Closed channels can open up. Right now, what do you mean by closed channels opening up? If we have n channels that are open, how many closed channels do we have? One minus n. So one minus n closed channels opening up. Let's suppose that rate is alpha n. Alpha n is the probability at voltage V that a closed channel opens. So suppose this is closed, this is open. Let's suppose, let's forget about what I've drawn previously. This is closed, this is open. Alpha N is the probability that closed channels open and beta N is the probability that open channels will close, right? So this is my closed population. This is my open population. So the rate at which channels open is equal to the number of closed channels at one point in time multiplied by the probability that a closed channel can open. Isn't it so, right? Where did you lose it? So let's forget about the math. Let's write in English. Rate Okay, so rate is also difficult. Let's write the number of channels that open per unit time, right? Now, how do channels open? There are two ways. Uh, closed channels can open. So if you have N channels that are open at one time, how many closed channels would you have at the same time? One minus N. So number of channels that open per unit time is really the closed channels that open per unit time 
but it's also possible that channels that are already open they also they can also close in the same amount of time so from this you have to subtract the open channels that close per unit time ek minute aap jo de do so at one time you have n open channels at one time you have n open channels which means you would have 1 minus n closed channels so if i were to make a soup if i were to make a soup and i represent the open channels by these open dots and the closed channels by these filled dots so i have n of the open channels and i have 1 minus n of the closed channels right so g because we're talking about probabilities here this will be multiplied eventually by capital n so the, i'm invoking the ergodicity principle here right so this is a probability of a, a single channel or i'm looking at the ensemble yes uh we are assuming that they always switch they have to respond so and uh, so and we are only focusing on channels that open per unit time channels that remain clo are closed and remain closed they don't they don't affect the left hand side of this equation not the exact number the exact number for that you have to multiply with capital n and in order to complete this what do i need to do i need to have an expression for this term as well what's what is what should i write over here then n into beta n so beta n is the probability that open channels close alpha n is a probability that a closed channel opens at some voltage we're talking about at some voltage so now what do what does this look like this looks like a differential equation doesn't it right so this will give you the time dependence you solve this you'll get the time dependence so let's solve it i think by now it you should be really in in your in the wink of an eye you should be able to solve this equation right because we've done it so many times so if i were to solve this equation i could write this equation in another fashion dn by dt is equal to alpha n minus n alpha n plus beta n correct i can also write this as i divide both sides by minus n plus alpha n okay <coughs> what are the dimensions of alpha n what are the dimensions of alpha n and of beta n hmm? 
hmm? per unit time. Good, because this is the rate of switching per unit time. The probability that an open channel closes or the closed channel opens per unit time. So one over alpha will have units of time, will have dimensions of time. So one over alpha n plus beta n is really a time constant. Okay, so let me rewrite this equation. I don't think I'll be able to cover the voltage dependent part today, but that's okay. So I'm going to, let's say, suppose that that one over alpha n plus beta n, I call it a time variable. It's time, time constant. And I put n with it because I'm talking about the gating variable n. Tau dn, dn by dt is minus n plus. Now that thing at the end, alpha n over L, what would be the dimensions over there of that ratio? It will be dimensionless. It will have the same dimensions as n. And this will be the steady state value because if here, I would, how do I find out the steady state value? I take the derivative, put the derivative to be zero. What happens when time has elapsed, elapsed quite a bit? So if time has elapsed quite a bit, this term becomes equal to zero. This term becomes equal to n. So this is really the population when at infinity. This is like an n infinity. Got it? So if you want to find a steady state solution, what happens when a long amount of time has elapsed? You put the derivative equal to zero, right? Remember the last lecture and the way we started today's lecture? We started today's lecture by introducing this V naught, V infinity, which is what would happen for very long amounts of time. For very long amounts of time, the current goes to zero, there n goes, dn by dt goes to zero. The population n doesn't change with time. So this means that alpha n over alpha n plus beta n will be some n infinity. Now this is my differential equation here. And I can solve this differential equation very easily. Minus n by tau plus n infinity by tau. And if I were to plot this, general form time n this is starting off some somewhere some initial condition and if the voltage doesn't change this is going to asymptote towards n infinity and this time constant is going to be equal to tau tau n this is the rate at which it approaches its infinite value if n infinity is small this will come down right but this is a general form that we know, we now know how generally n is going to change. It's going to relax towards n infinity. So we have one part of the puzzle figured out. The second part of the puzzle is how does n depend upon the voltage? Now there is, let's, let's do this. We're just taking five to six minutes. So we've seen how N, we've looked at the time dependence of N. Let's look at the voltage dependence of N. So all the voltage dependence is in N infinity and in tau, tau sub n. All the voltage dependence is in here. Remember that tau n is one over alpha n plus beta n, and n infinity is alpha n, alpha n plus beta n. So now these variables depend solely on voltages, right? The probability of switching open to close has to depend upon voltage, hasn't it? It must depend upon voltage because that was the claim. To change the 
So we've, we've already invoked the time dependence of N. Now we're going to get at the voltage dependence of N and that voltage dependence has bled in to alpha and beta. Now alpha is the probability that uh, a closed channel opens. Now, in order for a closed channel to open, if it were to be voltage dependent, we could write alpha N and we can invoke the Boltzmann principle here, actually. The Boltzmann principle is that if, for example, how do I now? Suppose this is my potassium channel. Now these are voltage dependent channels. These are voltage gated channels. So some kind of charge comes here. And there is some voltage V inside with respect to outside that is determining whether this gate is open or closed. All right. Now uh, at a certain potential, the gate being open has a certain energy and the gate being closed has a certain energy. And that energy depends upon the voltage because this is a voltage gated process. And we know that if we have a voltage V associated with this voltage, there is some potential energy, correct? And the Boltzmann principle states is that the fraction or the probability that you open up something from the closed state is going to be proportional to the exponent of the energy difference between the open and the closed forms, right? So you have two, suppose you have two energy levels, U1 and U2. The probability that you go from this lower energy to the higher energy level must depend upon the difference in energies, doesn't it? In chemistry, this is called the activation process. There's an activation energy and what the catalyst does, it lowers the activation energy, right? So according to the Boltzmann principle, which we've already seen, this, uh, the probability of this process happening has to be proportional to exponent minus the energy difference, U1 minus U2, over KBT, correct? This is the probability that an object can go from lower energy to the higher energy. All right, exactly in the same manner, the probability that a pore goes from closed to open state has to be given by, there has to be some normalization constant AN something to normalize things, minus an energy gap, which will depend upon the voltage. So I put a voltage here, V, right? And I can put some coefficient with this as well, An, which takes into account KBT and other factors, charges, for example, okay? Likewise, the probability that an open pore closes it's also a voltage driven process. Let's have another coefficient normalization exponent minus, let's call it minus B N V. This also depends upon the voltage. Now I can take this alpha N, take this beta N and insert into here, here and here. So let's do this for n infinity. Let's just do this for n infinity. Now, because of this voltage dependence, n infinity will become voltage dependent. Tau will become voltage dependent. Let's just look at what this form is going to look like. And then we'll, in the next lecture, we'll wrap up the story.
So if I concentrate on n infinity, n infinity is a n exponent minus a n v, a n exponent minus a n v plus b n exponent minus b n v. Now I can do some something. I can just divide by the numerator. I get plus b n over a n exponent minus b n minus a n v n infinity. Now here n infinity depends upon voltage. So I have brought voltage dependence into my gating variable. If I were to plot this function with respect to voltage, now I'm looking at the voltage dependence of n infinity, not n, but n infinity. n infinity is the value of n to which n asymptotes to, right? It's the infinity value. Now, if I plot this function, now you can use the same tricks that as we already do. I can plot the exponent, add one to it, and put it in the derivative in the denominator. I will get something of this kind. Which means that as the voltage goes up, crosses a certain point, and infinity goes from zero to some maximum value. So the probability of switching from close to open depends upon voltages now. This is called a sigmoidal function. Sigmoid. This is this kind of function is called a sigmoid. It's very important in neuroscience. So now what we have, if you look at the conductances again, GK is n raised to the power four, where n is a dependent on voltage and on time, some GK conductance for a single channel and the number of channels. So this is some constant, by the way. We now have time dependence built in here. And we also have the uh, voltage dependence built in here. All right. So how do we get N? We get N by solving this equation here. Solving this equation requires a knowledge of alpha and beta N, which means requires a knowledge of tau and N infinity, which requires a knowledge of the voltage. So this is a cyclic process. So likewise, what Hodgkin and Huxley, Huxley showed is that for the potassium channel, we have a conductance of this kind. N is a gating variable for potassium. For the sodium channel, we have a similar expression. G sodium, N sodium. But now we have another variable. It's not N, it's called M. And M has a similar equation as N. But the only difference is that M is now taken to its third power. And then there's another variable H as well, being multiplied with M cube. M is the activation of the sodium and H represents the deactivation, inactivation of the sodium channel. So these equations together form the, uh, make this these conductances voltage and time dependent. So now let's give me just two sec, uh, two minutes or possibly one minute, I'm sorry for that. I just wanna show you what the algorithm looks like. I think we've, we've completed the picture here. Nothing else to go. And this might be your homework number two. All right, so you're given some VK 
V sodium, V L, you given some G K, G L, G sodium, you given some N K, N sodium, N L, right? You given all of these things. You given C, the capacitance C. You start off with some V, small V. the membrane potential. You start off with some N, M, and H. All three could be zero. The gated voltages are zero. You start off with some initial values. Your goal is to find out the variation of V with time, the action potential, simulating the action potential. Then what you would do, you would find out N infinity, M infinity, H infinity. But for that, you will need alpha n, beta n, alpha m, beta m, alpha h, beta h. The rates of probabilities of channels opening and closing. And these will be provided to you. These will have the sigmoidal form. Uh, sorry, this will have the Boltzmann form. This will have the sigmoidal form. And then you would also need tau n, tau m and tau h, right? So for each voltage, so all of this is voltage dependent. You start the loop of your computer program, enter the loop with some initial values. First of all, in the first step of the loop, you find out the voltage dependent quantities here. And then in the next step, you would like to solve what n is going to be in the next step, right? And how do, how do I know that? n I know is dn by dt tau is minus n plus n infinity, correct? So n at, at the point k plus one, the next iteration of a loop is going to be n at the previous iteration plus the rate of change of n into your time step, isn't it? This is how you solve, right? Uh, you want to find out in the Taylor series, you want to find out what happens to n at the next step, look at the previous step and to that step add the change. The change is how does n change with time multiplied by the time step? This dn can come directly from here, nk plus minus n plus n naught over tau d tau. And you've already found out these values in the previous step. So, I, so from n, the kth step, go to the next step, which means you're really solving the differential equation. And you're doing it by time integration. Look at the previous value of n, find out the next value of n. And you don't really have to solve the differential equation because it's first order linear, you know what the solution is. So from the previous n, you can predict the next n. Likewise, predict the next m. Predict the next h. Now, when you have these values, you can find out what the conductances are. Gk is n is power four v minus vk ngk, right? And so on. From this, you would get the conductance. Finally, you look at the final differential equation that I have at the top right over there. So you can now predict from the kth value of vk, the next value of vk by solving the big master equation for the currents. And that's also use the same recipe over here. In this manner, what I expect you to be able to do is starting off with some value of V, see whether you get the action potential or not. And plot at the same time, how does N change with time? How does M change with time? What are the gate variables looking like?
Hadi is going to construct a homework problem around this. Programming based. All right, so we continue our next lecture. We'll spend five to 10 minutes on this model again for your questions. And please start working or proposing by the end of this next week, some projects that you would like to do. These projects would be three to four pages long, some biophysical process in the human body perhaps that involves some physics and mathematics. Thank you very much.